Hello YouTube, uh, and probably aspiring game designers. I found an old presentation I did in Sweden back in 2010. Um, back in 2010 a lot of things were different. I don't even agree with some of the things that I was saying in this presentation, but I thought it was interesting, and I didn't want to just... Uh, I've got a YouTube channel, I may as well put it out there. So, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I, I found it interesting, especially my beard. You'll see what I mean. Oh, do you say no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I hope you're English is much better than my Swedish, and I'm sure it is. Uh, so I'm going to talk about basically my career in the game industry, and uh, I'm going, hoping to give you a bit of insight into what it's like to work in the industry and what you can expect from a variety of places uh, that you might end up working at. Uh, hopefully, if I've done a good job, uh, you'll you'll have a pretty good idea. If not, feel free to criticize me afterwards. Um, sorry, first time working with this. Here. So a little bit about me. Uh, David Christopher Freed. Uh, you can look me up on the web and find all sorts of interesting stuff about me. I've been in the industry for 12 years. Uh, I started at Bloomberg Entertainment in Quality Assurance. I actually called 411, which is in America the information number, and I asked, what's the number for Blizzard? And they gave me their number. I called them. I said, do you need a guy who knows Macintosh computers? And they said, yes. So a month later, I had a job testing games uh, for Blizzard Entertainment. That's not the normal way to get into the industry, though. <laughs> um, I worked my way into level design. After a year, uh, I showed some proficiency with the StarCraft map editor and they pushed me into level design for the Map of the Month program. Uh, my maps are still online if you want to go and uh, download them. Uh, my favorite one was called Deception, uh, which had a lot of store elements into it. Uh, that actually ended up being canon for the game uh, and is still used in StarCraft II. I moved into game design after I left Blizzard. Uh, I was only there for five years. I uh, started this point. Uh, I went to Oddworld Inhabitants, uh, where I worked on uh, Stranger's Wrap. Uh, I also worked on the Frozen Throne expansion for Warcraft. I worked a little bit on World of Warcraft uh, as well. I did about 40 quests that are still in the game, but when Cataclysm comes out, those are all gone. Uh, the Da Vinci Code was uh, the last game that I actually shipped, which was a while ago, uh, which is kind of sad. Uh, I've worked on a lot of games since then, but they will probably never see the light of day, and I'm not supposed to talk about any of them. But, there they were. <laughs> now I'm working at Tarsier. Uh, I'm a senior game designer there, uh, working with the design team on other things I can't talk about. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about my survey. So I did a lot of research. I talked to all my friends in the industry. I got 54 game developers to participate in my survey. Uh, hopefully uh, it wasn't in vain, but uh, my questions primarily focused on their number of years in the industry, uh, their job satisfaction, and uh, whether or not the concepts uh, that they worked on were in the game. So my survey is not so great. Uh, what happened was that my uh, questions were not specific enough. I didn't ask questions like, when you worked at this company, what uh, what was your feeling about working there, and, and how did that go? So um, there's some flaws. So what ended up having having to happen is I have to do my personal bias, uh, and for that I'm very sorry. Uh, so. Uh, I'll tell you when I'm going into my personal bias and what my personal experiences were as opposed to what my survey results showed. So, let's talk about your career from my survey. Um, the average time in the industry is seven years according to my survey. Uh, that doesn't mean that your whole career will be seven years, but um, for the people who took my survey, seven years was the average amount of time they've been in the industry. Uh, there was a survey done in 2005 that said that most people left the industry after 10 years. Um, I don't know if that's still true. I'd like to do a survey 2.0 and find out. Um, but for now, consider that 
what you'll probably be at in seven years. Seven years. The average time to make a game, 14 months. Um, that's just how long most people took to make a single game. That the, that you'll see that that varies a lot from big companies to small companies. Big companies tend to take a lot longer, especially if it's a big budget title. Uh, Warcraft 3, for instance, was three and a half years in the making. Diablo 2 was five. World of Warcraft six. Uh, the average number of games that you'll publish in your career in the industry is six. <clears throat> you'll make six games. That's not a lot. 34% will be based on your concept. These will be games that you came up with and you made entirely on your own. That's two games. Uh, and then 50% of the games you work on will contain some of your concept. That is, you'll contribute ideas, but it won't be based entirely on, on your ID. Uh, that's three. And then 16% will have none of your concept. That is, you'll just participate in creating the game, but you won't get any of your ideas into it. That's what my survey showed. I don't know that that's necessarily true. It's certainly not true for my career. So this is a very awful chart that I will try to explain uh, that came out of my survey. Uh, let's start in the bottom left. So this group of people, these are games that they uh, contributed concepts to. Uh, and what you see here is their job satisfaction. The blue one is whether or not they enjoyed the work. The yellow one is whether or not they were proud of their work. And then the third one is how they felt about the final product, so they're proud of it. Uh, as you can see, the people who worked on games with their concepts in them, very high percentage of satisfaction. They enjoyed working on it. They were proud of their work. Um, a little less proud of the end product, maybe because other people got their ideas in and they didn't like their ideas. I'm not sure. Uh, games based on your concept. That is, games entirely coming from the designers uh, that were created the entire game. You can see that uh, everything is much higher. It's all in the 90% range. Uh, they enjoy their work. They're very proud of the work. Um, and they were very proud of the end product. Uh, I think there was only one guy who didn't like what he had made and didn't like working on his own concept. And I'm not sure why. Uh, games without your concepts in them, you can see that the percentages go much lower. 50% um, enjoy around 45%. Around 50% enjoy the work. They're still proud of the work. and still proud of the product. So even if you're not working on a game that you necessarily like uh, contributed your ideas to, you may still enjoy working on it. But it's a much lower percentage. Uh, so as far as games without concepts, I worked on one, actually. And it was the Golden Compass. It's a horrible pile. Don't play it. Uh, don't even look it up online. <laughs> All right, this seems intimidating, but it's not so bad. Uh, I want to talk about big companies and what it's like to work uh, at them. You'll see that there's a lot of, uh, a, quite a variety of design positions at large companies. Um, they've got their design directors, their lead game designers, their lead level designers, systems designers, technical designers, game designers, associate game designers, and level designers. Uh, Generally speaking, to get into these positions, you either have to have a lot of industry experience or have an inside track, such as a friend who works there in the design department who believes in your skills, or you have to totally blow them away with your skills via a demo reel. Um, the easiest position to get uh, is probably level design, because most big companies, they need a lot of level designers. They need content. Uh, if there's an MMO, they need content designers as well, which I didn't put on here because <coughs> they didn't get any survey results from them. But uh, level design and content design are typically considered similar things. Um, as you can see, the creative control that you have is uh, largely based on your position. But what's interesting is that design directors had less creative control than some of the other positions. And why that is is because at a lot of big companies, what they're typically doing is a sequel. So if you're doing a sequel, you really can't innovate a lot. You don't really have a lot of innovative control because you can only do an FPS so many ways. Maybe you can add a little bit of something, but you're basically copying the previous game and doing it again. And that's why design directors tend to have less creative control because they don't have the time to work on systems and things like that within the game. They're basically managing the whole project. And so the big picture thing, if it's a sequel, is just, what was the previous game? Let's do that again. Uh, so lead game designers have a lot of creative control in this respect, because typically it's up to them to come up with the innovation that separates their sequel from the previous game. Uh, 
these level designers, they have a good amount of control. Uh, they can set the progression and things like that for the entire game. Uh, game designers also have some good amount of control. But level designers have a lot of the control. And I'm going to talk more about that later. So let's talk about what design input you can have at a big company. Um, it's primarily dependent upon your position. If you're toward the top of design, you have a lot of say over what the core game will be about. Uh, well, normally you would, but a big company is the core of the product is often determined by executives and marketing. That is to say, if FPS games are big this year, you're probably going to make an FPS. And if your last game was an RTS and it sold really well, you'll probably be making a sequel to that RTS. Uh, if it didn't sell well, you're probably unemployed. Uh, that's probably why in my survey there were even design directors that had zero games that were made entirely based on their concept. So the closer you are to the end process, the more you get to influence the final product. Um, if you are the design director, you don't get much say on the big picture because that comes down from the executives. So believe it or not, there are two groups who have much more influence over the final product than most of the higher up positions. Level designers. Uh, how can a level designer have more influence than a lead game designer or even the design director? Well, because whatever mechanics that are given to them, uh, the level designer must use them in a way that makes the game fun. In fact, most of the time the level designers end up using mechanics in an unintended way to create fun gameplay. Uh, the better and more versatile the tools provided, the more control the level designer has over the experience. And many large companies spend a lot of time on their tools to make sure that the level designers can make a fun game. So at the end of the day, whether a game lives or dies, pretty much uh, comes down to the level designers. If they do a bad job, then the game will suffer. The gameplay will not be fun. If the level designers, designers do a great job, then you've got a good game in your hand. Quality assurance. What? Yes. Uh, why? Because if your game comes out with a lot of bugs, it's not going to do well. Uh, no matter how good the underlying mechanics or even the level design is, many companies make the mistake of pushing a product out early. A critical crash bug that slips through and destroys even 10% of the player base experience can cripple the product. Uh, no one wants to play a game full of bugs. And, I mean, I certainly don't. And I hope you don't either. So, what about innovation? Um, well, <coughs> there's not much. Uh, but to truly feel like you're contributing to game design as a whole, you need to work on something innovative. Uh, you're very unlikely to find that at a large company. Uh, even Ubisoft, which really strains itself to try and come up with innovative design principles, rarely pulls it off and often packs what they call innovations on to an already worn out genre. Uh, Splinter sells big innovation with Light and Shadow, but it never quite worked and they were already following in the footsteps of games like Metal Gear. Um, and as Splinter Cell has progressed, it's followed a pattern of innovation that imitates popular movies and other games. Conviction, makes, uh, Conviction imitates the styling of the Born Identity movies, and Chaos Theory jumps on the bandwagon of cooperative gameplay that was being pushed by Gears of War, Army of Two, and Kane and Lynch. Um, but every big company gets their ideas from somewhere, so let's talk about the ways that you can participate in the creation process at these larger companies. So, <coughs> So what's it like to participate in the creation process of big companies? Well, it entirely depends on the lead. Uh, if the lead designer is an arrogant douche who thinks they know everything there is to know about everything, they probably won't ask for anyone else's opinion. But if they're sensible, and they know that good ideas can come from almost anywhere, which is true, uh, they will make the design process much more collaborative. So in the collaborative process, there are usually meetings scheduled for ideas and information sharing. Uh, these typically happen in the production, uh, uh, in the pre-production phase. You'll find that the success of these meetings is entirely dependent upon the direction given by the lead designer who calls them. If the lead designer is genuinely interested in getting your input, uh, they'll send out items and examples of design that will be discussed before the meeting, and then <coughs> uh, they'll give you some time to think about these things before actually having the meeting. And, and this, these kind of processes vary from company to company. Uh, when I worked at Blizzard over five years ago, they had a very bad collaboration process. Um, <laughs> designers were included or excluded from meetings at a whim. Uh, meetings rarely had any warning, and participants often came totally unprepared. 
Uh, I imagine things have improved, um, but it doesn't really matter because despite any collaboration process, uh, decisions are made independently, independently by those in power. So here again, you're at the whim of the lead, or, or worse, the executives above the lead. Some companies have better processes than others. For example, Blizzard was very much about doing what the team wanted. If the people working on the game felt the game needed to shift in direction, then it would. Uh, and the president would support their decision. Uh, an example of that is Warcraft Lord of the Clan, which was an adventure game you probably didn't hear about. Um, it was being made by Blizzard. The quality assurance guy said this game sucks, and Blizzard shut it down. Uh, I've never heard of a company shutting down a game based on quality assurance uh, saying that the game play itself sucks. So that's pretty unique. Um, so <clears throat> at Ubisoft, it was quite the opposite. The team was completely at the mercy of what a couple of executives thought about the project. Um, in case you're curious, they're called the editorial team, and they work out of Paris. Uh, it, the editorial team is unique in the industry. Uh, you probably won't find that at most companies. Uh, it's a group of people who failed at some other job. Uh, so they became masters of design by reading articles about game design written by Shigeru Miyamoto. And uh, <laughs> this causes them to make poor decisions when it comes to game design because few of them seem to play any games and most of them haven't designed anything in many, many years. Uh, the point is that at most large companies, the final decision-making process usually does not go to the design team. So whatever collaboration you may participate in can ultimately prove to be pointless. I guess the sub theme here is that uh, big companies waste a lot of your time. Uh, maybe that's why it usually takes them a lot more than 14 months to get a product out. But hey, it's not all bad or no one would work for the Empire. <laughs> so there are perks. There are a lot of perks, actually, to working at uh, big corporations. Uh, job security. Big companies tend to take a long time to go out of business, uh, particularly if they're doing well. So even if they do start to go down, there are typically at least seven packages for the people who got screwed. Uh, the most dangerous place to be in a big company is a recent hire for an unannounced game at a sub-company that was purchased by a larger company within the last two years. No, I'm sorry. Uh, when EA, Activision, or Ubisoft needs to lay off some people to make their quarterly report look better, that's where they're going to start. Uh, another perk, free stuff. Uh, most big companies have some major perks in the free stuff department. When I worked at Blizzard, I would get one of every product that had been released by Blizzard that year. Uh, right around Christmas time. And there would even be a bonus item, like a, a jacket with a company logo and things like that. Uh, the Christmas after Warcraft 3 ship was particularly good because we got all the action figures that came out for the game, plus the novelization, plus a leather jacket. It, it really felt like Christmas there. Um, <laughs> there's also benefits like free sodas, free food if you're working late, uh, and at nicer companies, free movie days or visits to the local arcade. Um, and Gorilla has free end spells every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the nicest thing that working at big game companies are, is going to get you are game industry contacts. Uh, the no it's just, uh, if you spend a significant amount of time at a large company, you're going to meet a ton of people. Uh, and a lot of these people are going to go on to other companies. Uh, the turnover rate tends to be pretty high at larger companies. Uh, with the exception of Blizzard. Uh, Ubisoft was one of the worst, at least in Shanghai. Um, anyway, these people you meet are going to go on to other companies, and they're going to move up in their career, and they're going to form their own company. Um, because of my five years at Blizzard, I now have contacts at Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Riot Games, Supervillain Studios, Bioware, and a whole bunch of other places. Um, and there's one other huge perk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, big name games on your resume. Uh, if you can manage to stay through a full project, you get your name in the credits of a big time game. If it's Call of Duty 4 or Diablo 3 or even Assassin's Creed, your resume will get instantly noticed. Having Warcraft on my resume opened a lot of doors into other big name studios, um, and it gave me a lot of options for where I wanted to work. Uh, the truth is, I only worked on World of Warcraft at the very early stages and made about 40 quests before leaving. All that work will be gone but WoW will always be on my resume. So that was the good stuff. Let's talk about the bad. <laughs> There's a lot of bad. <laughs> so I'm just trying
trying to be honest with you guys. I don't want you to, to think I'm hating. But uh, uh, you can feel a lot like a cog in the wheel. Uh, it is a big tendency to feel like you're just a number on a page or a resource to be moved around. Uh, the worst offender of this was Ubisoft Shanghai. If you're not a big fan of time cards, feeling like you're washed, having your email and internet usage monitored, and having to sign nasty non-negotiable contracts that basically give complete ownership of everything you ever do to the company, sometimes even stuff you do in your spare time, then you might want to avoid working in these kinds of places, or at the very least, read your contract very carefully and make sure that there's nothing like that. <coughs> um, another bad thing that can happen is making enemies. So making contacts is the good part, making enemies is the bad part. If you're particularly outspoken, as I might be, or if you put in design elements that offend certain people, uh, as for example I did when I made the player murder children in the first version of the Cullen of Stratholme, <laughs> 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 you might find yourself with some people who find your preference distasteful. Um, though it was never made clear what was so upsetting about it, it was an issue with our possible ESRB rating, so the children and eventually the women were removed. Uh, so much for quality. Uh, and this is all well and good until those people that you pissed off then move to other companies and gain positions of power. I've been denied a position at an Activision company because someone or another remembered me from Blizzard and really didn't like me. So it's a small industry, uh, so at least try to smile and play nice. Or concepts. Uh, if you should land a job at a big company, it's in your best interest to not give them your big concepts. Not only will they most likely ignore you, they may now own the rights to it simply because you sent out an email or talked to someone at work about it. Okay, I can't emphasize that enough. When you work for the big companies, work on their ideas and improve those. If they specifically come to you and they ask you to make a big new concept game, then you might want to whip out something you've been saving. But nine times out of ten, you'll be working on minor innovations in a franchise sequel. Uh, and layoffs. So in January of this year, EA laid off 10% of its workforce, or 1,000 people. THQ and LucasArts laid off a bunch of people too, and Midway laid off 25% of its workforce. Why? Well, it had little to do with their individual performance, uh, and everything to do with making their stock look profitable for the upcoming quarterly financial report. Uh, at a larger company, if layoffs do come to your uh, game, your individual skills and performance will become irrelevant, and you may lose your job. Uh, I worked at a small company that got by a group of game investors, uh, thus becoming part of a larger corporation, and there was big talk about how they were going to sell our games and do all sorts of wonderful things, uh, but they proved to be incompetent. And when their finances started going sour, uh, because they didn't get the investors they expected, they told the founders of the company I worked for that they were going to send guys in suits to fire half the staff if the founders didn't lay off 50% of their own workforce. <laughs> the bottom line is uh, a cruel mistress sometimes, and when you have executive overlords in control of the company you work for, your job is always a financial report away from being laid off. Finally, there's the worst thing ever at big companies, and that's the drama. Uh, if you've seen the recent blogs from EA Laos, decrying the fall of Warhammer Online and declaring that uh, Star Wars The Old Republic will suck, uh, then you already know what I'm talking about. If not, uh, let me just say that when corporate executives start tearing, up, uh, st start tearing up dead teams and making bad decisions, the hostility and anger that can sprout throughout the company is awe-inspiring. If you choose to work at a big company, avoid the drama at all costs. Be an innocent bystander. Do not join in the conflict. Uh, you look bad, the company looks bad, and the game looks bad. It's a triple lose. <clears throat> In case you're curious. Why don't you write that down? Let's talk about small companies. So, uh, you'll see most of the positions are the same. Uh, mainly because small companies tend to come from big companies. Uh, as people who disagree with the big company business method decide they can do it better on their own, and then they end up copying everything they can remember from the big company anyways, except for the one or two things they didn't like. Uh, what's different is that there are a lot of small companies, and a lot of them haven't put any big, uh, big name titles out, so it's easier to get in the door with a little bit less on your resume than you would need to, get, to even get looked at by larger companies. Uh, one position is nearly impossible to get, though, and that's the design director role. 
Uh, most of the time, that's the owner of the company. So there's no getting around that. Um, individually, each position is probably going to be filled by friends of the owners or by people who know people within the company. Uh, the best chance is through level design. Uh, typically, a game is going to need a lot of level designers in order to come out in a reasonable amount of time, so they'll take in people that don't, they don't necessarily trust in order to get the game done. Uh, you'll also find junior design positions available, but it depends on what they're doing. More often than not, the junior designers end up doing level design anyways. Uh, both systems designers and technical designers tend to be rare at small companies. Uh, that kind of diversification seems unnecessary when everyone's going to be doing the same is going to be doing game design and level design anyways. Uh, at Our World Inhabitants, for example, uh, we were all just game designers with one lead designer and, of course, the design director, and that was Lauren Landing, the owner of the company. Uh, so let's talk about what kind of design input you can have at small companies. Um, it tends to be good. At smaller companies, there are less voices and there's more uncertainty. So there tends to be a lot more acceptance of inputs and meetings to generate input from everyone. Uh, when there are less ideas overall, your ideas have a better chance of making it into the game. And at a smaller company, your position becomes less relevant uh, than whether or not your ideas are liked by the majority of the team. Um, as far as innovation goes, there are some chances for that. Small companies will often allow more innovative concepts into the game because they're trying to make a name for themselves. Uh, of course, this usually only applies to their own games because when they're doing something for a client, uh, they will often get scared of losing that job if they do something too different from the expectations of the client. Um, let's talk about creation participation. Um, there's not much to say here. If the owners want their employees to have a say in what's going on in the studio, then they'll ask for opinions. If they don't want it, then they won't. Uh, at the few small studios I've worked at, the owners tended to have a very open attitude towards the inner workings of the company. Uh, within a week of an event at Superbone that would ultimately cause half the company to be laid off, we were all told exactly what was going on and why. I don't expect that kind of openness to happen at most companies, but because small companies are more tight-knit, there's more chances of them being more open and honest with their employees. Uh, Tarsier also has a very open process and encourages people to submit their game ideas for future consideration while specifically not taking ownership of them. So if you want to know what sort of creation process the studio has, talk to the owners first and see what their attitude is. That will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. And by the way, if you do a search for Matias online, that's what comes up. But if you do a search for these people who own Supervillain, you just get little icons. You don't actually find their pictures. Interesting side note. <laughs> Uh, so perks, there are a lot of benefits, well not a lot, there's some benefits to working at small companies. Uh, it's not for everyone, but there are several benefits uh, that you may find appealing, aside from the ability to get more of your design into the game. <clears throat> it's a friendly atmosphere. Um, because it's a smaller tight-knit group, uh, the atmosphere tends to be a little more friendly. There's less talking behind people's backs and more openness. There are usually a few people who are disruptive backstabbing, backstabbing connivers, but most small companies will get rid of those people quickly if they're too disruptive, whereas at a larger company, the backstabbing connivers tend to be promoted to positions of management. <laughs> uh, game industry contacts. Just as with larger companies, you will make contacts. But what's interesting about smaller companies, uh, particularly ones that go belly up, is that because you probably had tight-knit relationships with the people there, you'll find that you suddenly have good contacts at a wide variety of large and small companies. Uh, when Oddworld Inhabitants dissolved, the people there went on to a multitude of companies including Valve, Insomniac, EA Maxis, Game On Recruiting, Warner Brothers, Codemasters, and a whole bunch of others. Um, of course, whether or not they're going to answer your emails and distribute a game developer survey for you is an entirely different matter. Uh, at small companies, you tend to get unique titles. Uh, they want to make a niche for themselves. So when they get an opportunity to do their own thing, it's usually going to be something very unique that the industry doesn't have a lot of. An example you're probably all familiar with is the city of Metanrome, uh, but I can't talk about it. Uh, pretty much everything Oddworld did was unique, and if Supervillain ever gets an opportunity to do what they really want to do, their games will be quite interesting as well. And the bad side, uh, smaller wages. Yeah, it's a fact. They don't have as much money as the big companies. Uh, it's not true for every position, though. For entry-level positions, 
uh, you can get paid probably very similarly. Blizzard notoriously pays their uh, uh, level designers low wages. Um, however, as you move up in the company, uh, at a bigger corporation, your salary would go tend to grow quite fast. Um, whereas at a small company, they just can't afford to do that. Uh, and then there's this, the biggest fear of every small company is that uh, they're not gonna get their next project. Uh, a lot of companies only have enough people and time to focus on one thing. Uh, so if that falls through, or the larger company that was funding it pulls out, uh, the small company can go belly up. Uh, while contracting with Spicy Horse, I was constantly pitching new games to a variety of developers because they needed to know that after Alice 2 ships, there's something for them to be moving on to. If you're looking to join a smaller company, uh, look for ones that are self-sufficient and self-funded. Uh, Valve was a good example about 12 years ago when they first released Half-Life. Gabe Newell was the owner of the company and also independently wealthy. Uh, with a little help from Sierra, he was able to fund his baby and retain all rights. Uh, and thus, when Half-Life became huge, their company was pretty much completely free of the chains of a larger corporation or from having to get funding from anyone else ever again. Uh, of course, now they are one of the larger corporations. <clears throat> uh, Riot Games is also a great example. Uh, Riot Games has shipped one title, uh, that's League of Legends. I suggest you play it, it's very fun. Uh, but thanks to their smart business model and community support, they are so well funded that they now fund other development studios. Incredible. Uh, and that's a free to play game, by the way. Uh, Typically what happens with small studios is that um, it's just a fact of life that when you first start your, your company, you're going to end up doing ports. Um, and, uh, you know, no one's going to fund a big title uh, for a new company. It's like, uh, who are you? Yeah. You, what have you done? Nothing? Okay. Well, no, you can't have my money. Um, Thus, most, <laughs> most small companies spend the first five or so years of their studio's life doing ports of other games or outsourced work uh, for other games. It's a method of survival. Um, it's not usually fun for us designers. Uh, in fact, many studios during these early years will have no designers because they feel they don't need them. Um, Blizzard Entertainment, believe it or not, started this way. Uh, the three founders, Mike Moore, Heim, Allen Adham, and Frank Pierce, funded their company in 1991, which was called Silicon Synapse back then. Uh, using only their credit cards. Uh, they did ports of other games for three years before they got to make Rock and Roll Racing and The Lost Vikings. Uh, have you ever heard of those? <laughs> yes. Uh, their first two titles. Okay. Indie games. This is uh, actually kind of new stuff to me. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not an indie designer, so I can't claim any personal knowledge of this field. So this is completely based on my conversations with the few indie designers that I know, uh, one of which is Jonathan Blow, who made Brave. Um, so there's really only one position for an indie designer. You're either an indie designer or you're not. <clears throat> um, you can work with a team and whatever, but if you're the, the designer for it, you're the indie designer. Um, uh, there's no qualifications to be an indie designer. Um, Though I would have to say that until you get at least one game out on your own, you're actually not a real indie designer. I'm certainly not. Um, but the creative control is high, you have complete control, and your chances of getting the position are, it's just a decision you make. You want to be an indie designer, do it. So your input, it's 100%. Um, but with 100% control, uh, you know, it can, it can get kind of lonely. Uh, <clears throat> the, the only people you have to listen to about your design is the people that you solicit for feedback. And you can choose not to listen to whatever they tell you anyways. Um, but that's pretty much complete creative control, which might explain why any designers tend to not go into the industry uh, and try to get jobs. Uh, why would they want to give up that control? So there's a lot of perks, actually. Um, you have that 100% control, and you get 100% of the return of the profits. Uh, everything is on the indie designer's shoulders to make that game happen. Um, and if you've played indie games, you'll find them stunningly unique. Uh, anyone who's made the claim that games are not art has clearly not played indie games. 
Uh, I myself constantly play them because there's some amazing ideas out there for me to steal and, and utilize. <laughs> utilize my own design efforts. Uh, the indie community is actually also very inspiring and helpful. Uh, if you need critical feedback, it's easy to get help from the various websites and forums. From what I have seen, they are a very tight-knit group and always willing to discuss topics of design at great length. And in recent years, there have been a lot of uh, indie game development organizations doing things like giving cash rewards to promising titles or holding contests. Uh, the indie community of game developers is definitely growing, and it's most definitely becoming profitable as the industry as a whole moves towards free-to-play and digital, digital distribution models. Um, but there are some drawbacks, primarily. Everything is on you. Uh, the, game, the game will live or die at your hand. Uh, you can't get tired and lean on others to do the heavy lifting for you, uh, as you often can at uh, development studios. Um, if you stop working, everything stops. And financially, you're on your own. Um, if you're not independently wealthy or have someone who will take care of your housing, food, and other needs while you make the first few games, and hopefully a profit, uh, you're kind of screwed. And if you just squeak by on your profits and you never really get a tremendous hit, uh, you're always one failure away from ending up in the poorhouse. Um, you can take the risk and try for a government grant or a small business loan from the bank, but the economy is pretty horrible these days, uh, particularly in America. Uh, here in Sweden, though, there are a lot more opportunities for such funding. So maybe it's not so bad here. <laughs> Finally, if your goal is to get into the industry, the indie community is probably not the best way to do that. Uh, though the indie community is very tight-knit, uh, very few seem to leave it to go into big game businesses. Uh, some do develop their own small companies, and some do maintain contacts with the industry folks, but it feels to me like a separate world than that of the game industry proper. So even after years of game development uh, within the indie scene, you may find yourself without any contacts in the game industry and thus fewer opportunities to get into the big game companies. So, <clears throat> what do you want to make? You have six games to make. One you will have no input on, three that will contain some of your ideas, and two that will be entirely your concepts. Do you want to design games with huge budgets at a large company, or do you want to make small indie games? Does your enjoyment of your work matter more than what you're creating? Do you need to be in control of the design to be having fun? Uh, everyone's answers are different. Uh, but when you know what those answers are, that should tell you what sort of career you should be aiming for. The only real help I can provide is that according to my survey, the more creative control a designer has, uh, the higher chance that you're going to enjoy your work, the more pride that you will have in that work, and you're going to be much more happy with the end product. And I don't think, I don't think that's surprising to anyone. Some quick design tips. Uh, for people who are going to be applying to companies out there, I've been reading a lot of resumes lately. A lot of resumes lately. So I want to get the word out so I don't have to be annoyed anymore. Um, this should be obvious. Uh, your portfolio should reflect the job you are applying for. Uh, if you apply for a level design position and you send me links to your plant growing simulator, uh, do you really think I'm going to think you're right for the job? If you apply for a game design position and tell me that you've been game designer in a bunch of games but all of your mechanics are copied directly from another game, what makes you think I'm going to hire you? Um, you know, no, don't, don't do these things. Show me in your level walkthrough why your level is fun and what you did to make it stand out. YouTube is particularly good for this. If you, if you are a level designer and you want to pursue a career in level design, play through your levels and then talk over it and say, I put this here because of this, I, I made this encounter like this because the player will be thinking of this. That's what I want to hear. That tells me that you understand level design. Um, if you're a game designer, show in your mechanics why you took something from a game and what you changed to make it fit better in your game. Don't just copy this mechanic verbatim like, oh, uh, can't think of a good example, damn it. Uh, like uh, RPGs, uh, people will copy entire systems just verbatim like yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. I took the stat system. Why did you take the stat system? Because I like stats. That's not a, that's not a good answer. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, I have no reason to think you're any good at design. So this brings me to another pet peeve. Uh, a lot of people out there seem to think that there is no right or wrong answers in design. 
and that's just not true. Uh, when it comes to philosophy of design, there are differences of opinion where both can be right. But when it comes to what is right for a specific game, there are most definitely right and wrong answers. If you're trying to make an RPG that's easily accessible to people, having five different layers of statistics that they must keep track of is the wrong decision. If you're making a platform game that's happy and upbeat, forcing the player to die multiple times to understand and get through an area is the wrong decision. Um, uh, for Limbo, fine. Kill them all you want. Uh, I won't play it, but some people enjoy that sort of thing. Uh, the point is, if you think there are no right or wrong answers in design, and you stick to your opinions when everyone else is saying something doesn't make sense, reconsider your opinion. There are definitely wrong answers. And that's it. Questions? <laughs> Why did you start on the Tosios? What made you leave? Uh, well, it's kind of a unique situation. I was in China. Uh, I had worked at Ubisoft Shanghai. That didn't work out. Uh, for many of the reasons that I explained in my uh, in my uh, uh, presentation, uh, but I was looking around. I wanted to stay uh, abroad, not go back to America. And Tarsier is a good company. Uh, they have a lot of unique stuff that I can't talk about, uh, and they convinced me <laughs> that I should uh, uh, come here and uh, work on things that I can't talk about. <laughs> so. Uh, Sorry to sort of evade, but um, yeah, that, that's why. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, LinkedIn. Yes. Is that something commonly used in the industry? Yes, a lot of people use it. Uh, I have over, I think I have 300 contacts, and all of them are legitimately people that I met in the industry and work in the industry. Um, make a LinkedIn profile. Go, go do it now. Uh, put all of your info in there and uh, you'll start joining uh, game dev groups and start talking to people. Because uh, it is possible to get noticed on, in there by larger companies. They often peruse it looking for people uh, that would be a good fit for whatever positions they're looking for. And headhunters will even go on there. And if they like your profile or the games that you've worked on or think you're a good fit for a job, they will specifically talk to you and say, hey, we have an opportunity. So, yes, use LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of the industry uses it. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, the majority of my work on with uh, game engines has been proprietary. Uh, Blizzard makes all their own engines. Oddworld made all their own engines. Um, uh, I worked briefly with Unreal at Ubisoft. They tend to use Unreal for a lot of things. Other than that, uh, I have some experience in Unity, but most of my stuff is proprietary uh, stuff that I can't use anywhere else, which you know, kind of sucks, but uh, that's my situation. Yeah? Is it possible to put uh, Conspore links on LinkedIn? Uh, you can put links to stuff. Uh, you can't put concept right there. Primarily, it's just a, a place to put your resume um, and a good place to put your resume. But then I would link to a larger portfolio as well uh, and maintain your own website uh, that shows off your design skills and art and things like that. Yes? Department of Blizzard often uh, had a lot of input on the design and the, and the gameplay. Typically, um, at Blizzard in particular, uh, Sam Didier is the lead artist there for Warcraft Group. Uh, he would come in with a picture and he'd go, what do you guys think? And we'd go, oh, awesome. And then we'd start designing abilities and things around the picture. Um, and that's sort of uh, a design process that I like uh, to promote whenever I go to a new company. It's get everyone involved, bring the artists in, get them working with the designers, uh, because you're going to come up with a lot more interesting stuff if both people feel they have ownership over the end product. Um, so but my, the whole presentation was about design and, and how much creative control can affect and, and improve 
how you enjoy your work. But that's true for everyone at, at a game company, not just designers. Artists and stuff will feel that it's a, will feel better about their work if they have more creative control. So working together is, is critical. Yes. How do you feel when you play all the games? The inspiring is boring to see. They know what's happening there. Um. Well, it was so long ago since I played any of my own games. I recently played uh, Stranger's Wrath again, and uh, that game is so freaking awesome <laughs> that uh, I'm shocked it hasn't been verbatim stolen and used in another, uh, I mean, you, you push in the left click button to switch between the first person shooting elements and the third person action elements. Why hasn't that been, that been copied? I, I don't understand, because it's, it really works really well. Um, when I play Warcraft 3, uh, I pretty much feel nostalgic, kind of miss my days at Blizzard, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm moving forward, so. Uh, and that was 60 years ago. Seven, when was Warcraft 3 released? 2001? Four? Oh my god. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> questions? Anymore? Yes? Um, I have 11 designs today. Uh, do you think it's the easiest way to reach out to companies and other people? The easiest way to reach out uh, as a level designer is to um, make levels in something, in anything. Uh, put together levels, make sure they're fun, play them with your friends. Uh, if you want to get noticed by Valve, make Half-Life 2 levels or Counter-Strike levels, things like that. Make your own mod. Um, all of these things, I mean, Literally, Valve will hire entire mod communities uh, and like the Counter Strike team, and um, I can't remember the others, but there's a lot. Um, and then uh, my suggestion would be, when you're applying to, to studios, is to uh, do a walkthrough of your level where you talk over it and describe why you made all the decisions, because that will get you noticed more than anything else, because most people don't do that, and so you get this. Uh, you get a walkthrough of a level, it's just, oh, these are the pretty areas. And I go, great, what about the design decisions you made to make that level? And so that will put you ahead right there. Yep. Uh, would you say that uh, this uh, survey you did uh, holds true, not just for uh, level designers, but for graphical artists and everyone? I mean, uh, about the perks and detriments of work. Uh, the, the perks and detriments are definitely my personal bias. It's all from my personal experience in the industry. I wouldn't um, put too much stock in it. Your experience may be very different. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, to, to, to be honest. Uh, I didn't survey any artists uh, or things like that. But uh, the major points that I made are pretty much true. Um, at big companies, uh, you know, you're going to have less creative control uh, at if you're an indie artist, then obviously you would have 100% control. Uh, unless the design is like you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Which game are you are most proud of having in your uh, The game I'm most proud of? <clears throat> Stranger's Wrath, uh, for sure. Uh, it really sucked because we shipped it and um, you know, I put so much time and attention. Uh, I did a, a lot of the boss fights, uh, by the way. Uh, elbows freely and fatty boom boom and, and things like that. Um, and I even came up with the sniper gameplay um, that got used throughout the, the game. Uh, it, it was a real shame because EA uh, had some sort of dispute with Warren Lanning and so they didn't advertise for the game as much as they had promised. And ultimately it ended up killing the game and killing the company. Um, Warren Lanning left to do movies and the whole studio shut down. So uh, I'm most proud of my work on Strangers Wrath for sure. Anyone else? Um, this one might not be your field, but uh, about living color artists, uh, they are quite general. Uh, but uh, what do you think about uh, their future and uh, their influence in companies and uh, uh, how they are in smaller companies? Technical artists? Yeah. Uh, technical artists tend to end up becoming technical designers. And I don't know why, but um, 
that's what I've been seeing. Uh, at Blizzard, there were some tech artists, and they ended up being technical designers. And uh, at Tarsier, there's a, a technical animator. An animator became a technical designer, basically. Though it's just called a designer uh, at RCQ. Uh, last question. Yes? Yeah, uh, you got into the business through quality assurance, right? I did. Do you think that's a good way to get in? Because many people find like, quality assurance to be very soul-crushing work and not very related to the product. Well, it depends on the company. At Blizzard, it was great. Uh, quality assurance was listened to. Uh, when you came up with stuff, they were very willing to hear out why you had issues with, uh, with their uh, things. And so uh, it was a very easy transition from QA to level design there. That's not the case anymore. Uh, I'm talking about you know 12 years ago when I worked there. Um, now it's really QA is QA, and, and they don't move up there anymore. So it really depends on the company. Um, if you hear that a company has a lot of QA people who move into level design or things like that, then maybe you want to apply there and, and try for a QA position. At the very least, having QA on your resume is actually something I look for uh, when I'm looking at designers because it teaches you so much about um, how the design decisions that the level designers and the game designers make is going to affect um, the product at the end because you get to experience all the, the bugs and, and garbage that comes from their decisions. Um, and having that layer of uh, bug fixing uh, know-how or being able to find those bugs is, is pretty critical to making a good game. Uh, that's it? Yes. Yeah. A big hand for Dave.